Preliminary results of the second round of Niger's presidential election give former Interior Minister Mohamed Basum the victory with over 55% of the votes. The United Nations released its annual report to the human rights situation in Colombia this Tuesday, highlighting an increase in violence, assassinations and social leaders and a lack of state control. Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza expressed his gratitude to China on receiving the 10th flight carrying medical supplies to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Hello, welcome to From the South. I am Janet Perez Moya from the Telesur headquarters in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with the news. Stay with us. The president of the Independent National Electoral Commission of Niger, Isaac Azouna, announced the preliminary results of the second round of the presidential election this Tuesday. The ruling party's candidate, former Interior Minister Mohamed Basum, obtained 55% of the vote against 44% for his opponent, Mohamed Osman. Turnout was almost 63%. The opposition cried full and clashes were reported when Osman followers gathered near the headquarters of the ruling Nigerian party for democracy and socialism in Niamey. The elections have been showcase of the first democratic transitions in the history of the Coup Run Sahel State, which is also battling extreme poverty and two bloody jihadist insurgencies. I have the honor at this very moment to present to you the provisional overall results of the second round.
of the presidential elections of February 21, 2021. The overall participation rate is 62. Mr. Mohamed Basum, 2,501,459 votes, or 55.75%. Mr. Mahaman Osman, 1,985,736, or 44.5%. U.S. President Joe Biden met virtually with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau this Tuesday, marking his first bilateral meeting with the foreign leader since taking office last month. The meeting stalled to come to waters after the turbulent era of Donald Trump, who described Canada and other traditional U.S. allies as hostile competitors and was reported to have tense personal relationship with Trudeau. The White House said that the extensive talks will provide a roadmap for relations between the two neighbors. The first foreign leader to call Biden after he defeated Trump was Trudeau, while the first foreign leader Biden called after getting into the Oval Office was Trudeau. The United Nations on Tuesday elaborated uh, on the movements leading up to the deaths of those traveling in a World Food Program convoy in Congo. The previous day, UN spokesperson Stefan Duharic said the incident involved seven people traveling in two vehicles in the road from Goma to Rutshuru in eastern Congo, where they were planning to visit a WFP school feeding project. Uh, the security incident involved a group of seven people traveling in two World Food Program vehicles off the road, on the road from Goma to Ruchuru in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where they were planning a, to visit a World Food Program school feeding project. The group comprised of five employees of the World Food Program who were accompanying uh, the Italian ambassador to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, as well as his security escort. The group left Goma at approximately 9 a.m. local time. At approximately 10.15 a.m. local time, the two vehicles were stopped by an armed group, and all passengers were forced to disembark from the cars. The World Food Program driver of, excuse me, the World Food Program driver of one of the vehicles, Mustafa Milambo, was killed at this time. The remaining six passengers were then forced into the surrounding bush at gunpoint, where there was an exchange of fire. During the exchange of fire, the Italian ambassador, Luca Atanasio, and his security escort, Vittorio uh, Iucovacci, were mortally injured and subsequently died. The four other passengers in the group, Old World Food Program staff, evaded their abductors and are safe and accounted for. They include the World Food Program Deputy Country Director in the DRC, Rocco Leone, WFP School Feeding Program Assistant, Fidele Zab Zabandora, World Food Program Security... ...and prone to crashes. And uh, the Gulf Star was going at a relative greater speed than normal. Fans and Gulf prayer have taken to Twitter to wish him a speedy recovery. We will have this obligation under the 2016 peace agreement. In several parts of the country, there has been an escalation of violence and an increase in territorial and social control by non-state armed groups and criminal groups, with devastating consequences for the human rights in 2020. Our office documented 76 massacres, and we continue to document five other cases in 2020. These massacres led to the death of 292 people, including 23 women, 6 girls, 18 boys, 7 indigenous people, and 10 of African descent. On the second day of the 46th session of the UN uh, Human Rights Council, Bolivian Foreign Minister Rogelio Maita emphasized that his government is carrying out various measures to promote national reconciliation in the wake of the 2019 coup against the legitimate government of Evo Morales. 
The government that I represent is undertaking several actions to achieve national reconciliation, including promoting the investigation of the interdisciplinary group of independent experts acting within the framework of the protocol signed in November 2020 between the Bolivian government and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Because of our historical experience, we understand that in order to look forward, we must fight for accountability for the abuses committed in the past. We understand that this responsibility must be assumed by our state and by the entire international community. This must apply to all countries, small and large, for past and present acts. Whether it be taking responsibility for centuries of slavery in the global north or for recent coups in the global south, often led by the north. Addressing the 46th session of the UN Human Rights Council, Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez highlighted the universal scope of public health care on the island in the midst of the fight against COVID-19. In Cuba, the system of a free health care system of quality and universal scope guarantees the right to the health of all Cubans and all to regret the loss of life. It's made it possible to deal with the pandemic with positive results. Today, we have four vaccine candidates against COVID-19 in different phases of clinical trials. Thanks to the development of Cuban science and the dedicated work of our sciences, we hope this year to immunize the entire Cuban population. In Ecuador, 62 people were killed during riots in several of the country's prisons. The general headquarters of the Ecuadorian police report that the violent acts were registered at the detention center located in the province of Guayas, a social rehabilitation center in Azuay province and a penitentiary in Cotopaxi. The government stated that the prison riots were the result of coordinated actions by criminal organizations and that the progressive use of force was ordered to control the situation. The director of Ecuador's National Service of Comprehensive Attention to Adults Deprived of Liberty, Mundo Moncayo, explained the events that led to the riots reported in several prisons of the country. Once again, another group emerges, another criminal organization appears, and following an effort to take over the leadership, which unfortunately left a citizen dead in the city of Manta in December, we all expected an immediate reaction. However, the reaction has been delayed and today there are two groups vying for criminal leadership within our detention centers. The Ecuadorian official also offered an update of the number of deaths following the prison riots. That I would like to repeat the numbers of deceased. 21 are confirmed in the region of Guayaquil. We also reiterate that eight in Cotopaxi and in Turi, there are not 38, but 33 deaths that we have had, according to the information that INASEF has just given us. Finally, the director of the National Service of Comprehensive Attention to Adults Deprived of Liberty informed that the investigations will advance to determine who was responsible for the riots. We are working at this moment to determine whether our hypothesis has the strong premises that will help us to provide more information to the National Prosecutor's Office to bring to the attention of the judicial authorities those who plan this act. In IT, mass demonstrations continue demanding that President Juvenal Moïse step down from office. The current political crisis is due to a dispute between Moïse government and the opposition over when the president's term is supposed to end. Protesters have accused the US, OAS and other international organizations such as the United Nations of supporting Moïse government. On Tuesday, Haitian police used tear gas and rubber bullets to suppress university students protesting against kidnapping in the nation's capital. A student took to the street to demand the release of their teacher, Ries Edmund, kidnapped last Wednesday and non-identified individuals. As we say, ITNs took to the streets of the capital Port-au-Prince to denounce what they describe as an attempt to install a dictatorship by President Juvenal Moïse. Professor Danny Chau, senior research fellow of the Council of Hemispheric Affairs, bring us more details on the tense situation in the streets of IT. I think that's, that's an incredible question too. Why, why this repression? Why this US obsession, neo-colonial obsession with, with Haiti? Haiti was the crown jewel of the French Empire, and from 1915 to 1934, with the U.S. 
occupation, it was um, very beneficial. It's an incredible book everyone should read by Dr. Paul Farmer. It's, it's Haitian History 101, The Uses of Haiti. And that book lays out that um, more than 20% of Haiti was, was, was deforested um, during the U.S. occupation. They trained the, the, the Haitian paramilitary forces like they're doing right now. This JNF that I mentioned, this, this, this gang, gang of nine, this spider web of gangs across Port-au-Prince, that's what's controlling Haitian uh, destiny right now. And uh, a lot of people who um, are defenders or apologists of U.S. imperialism will say, but Haiti, Haiti's so poor. Why would the U.S. have any interest in Haiti? If Haiti is a shining star, how much hope does it give to the people of Mexico, of Ecuador, who are in a struggle against neoliberalism as we speak, to the people of Brazil? So, I see say, I say, what? But you see, pay you on Haiti standing up. Is is that 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 star, um, that star of hope for all oppressed countries? The same reason that they punished Haiti since 1804, since the Haitian Revolution, and maximum respect to the to the Haitian people um, who who continue to stand strong and are an example for the world. We will take a short break. We have more stories coming up. Stay with us. ¿Qué tal? Sean todos muy bienvenidos a Vidas. Hay lugares donde el arte se unifica con el orgullo de los pueblos. Y esos lugares están llenos de colores, alegría, pasión, tradiciones, arraigo, valor y entrega. Real Life Fridays Only on Telesur Innovation, science, the technological breakthrough and its influence in society. Viajeros del saber, el futuro está aquí. Atman. Monday, only on Telesur. Welcome back. In Venezuela, the Foreign Minister and Minister of Health received a 10th humanitarian aid flight from China, carrying medical supplies to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. According to authorities, the shipment contains 25 tons of medical equipment and supplies. Among this are antivirals, anticoagulants, steroids and other medicines, biosecurity means and a 20 device to measure blood oxygen levels. Foreign Minister Jorge Riaza thanked the Chinese President Xi Jinping and Ambassador Li Baoron who together with Russia, Turkey and the United Nations are helping to the country to overcome the limitations of the illegal and unilateral blockade imposed by the United States, which make it extremely difficult for Venezuela to purchase essential goods and supplies. We are receiving here 25 tons of supplies for COVID-19, treatments, clinical supplies, so that our patients in Venezuela can receive the best care we can provide free of charge. But we are also complementing 246 tons supplied through these 10 flights by the People's Republic of China, and more than 550 tons in total. If we add the cooperation and purchase agreements that Venezuela has reached with other countries and multilateral organizations. The Comptroller General of Venezuela, Elvis Amoroso, announced the list of former lawmakers disqualified from office for refusing to submit their sworn declaration of assets as it required by the Constitution. Among those sanctioners are notorious opposition members Juan Guaidó and Julio Borges. Tomás Juanipa, Luis Florido Germán Ferrer, Jesús Alexis Paparoni, Carlos Paparoni, Freddy Guevara, Juan Andrés Mejías, Julio Borges Franco, Casela Gavi, Arellano, Renzo Prieto, 
Servio Vergara, Carlos Valero, Winston Flores, Gómez, Juan Guaidó, Juan Pablo Guanipa, José Manuel Olivares. It is appropriate to remind the Venezuelan people that the sworn declaration of assets is a moral instrument that constitutes a preventive control mechanism in the fight against corruption. The government of the Dominican Republic has extended the curfew designed to curb the spread of COVID-19. The measure will now be placed until March 8 and will apply from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. Monday to Friday, while it will begin at 5 p.m. on weekends. The government hasn't ruled out the possibility of further extensions of the measure beyond March 8. Irish Prime Minister Michel Martin announced Tuesday that the country's first COVID-19 lockdown will be extended by a month due to the spread of a virus variant first identified in the United Kingdom. Non-essential businesses are to remain shut. The government's stay-home advice has been renewed and a five-kilometer travel limit will continue. We need to use the month of March to really drive down case numbers and get them as low as possible. However, the situation that we and indeed all of Europe find ourselves in today is very different to where we were just a short few months ago. The difference, of course, is the emergence of the so-called UK or B117 variant. It is equivalent to a new virus almost. This Tuesday, Montenegro began its vaccination campaign against COVID-19 with the Russian-made Sputnik B vaccine. The first two people to be vaccinated in the NATO member country were the Montenegro Minister of Health and the Director of the Infectology Department of the University Hospital of Montenegro. To date, the nation registered more than 72,000 COVID-19 cases and 957 deaths. Massive vaccination is our goal. Vaccination is not compulsory, but I recommend all citizens to get vaccinated. Priority groups will be vaccinated first, and then all other citizens can be vaccinated. A second shipment of the Russian vaccine will arrive in Montenegro on Thursday, 25 February, at Podgorica Airport, with a total of 50,000 doses planned for the first quarter of the year. In addition, a donation of 30,000 doses of the Chinese vaccine will leave Beijing for Montenegro on 27 February. Hundreds of health workers held their rally outside the Greek Health Ministry in the central Athens on Tuesday after marching to protest the suffocating conditions at the hospital on the front line of the coronavirus pandemic. Intensive care units at the state hospital are operating at roughly 80% capacity and doctors want the government to create new units for COVID-19 patients instead of using already existing ones, as well as to hire more staff and to use reserves from the private sector, more than 1,200 COVID uh, patients have been through intensive care in Greece since the pandemic began. With around 6,000 deaths, Greece has managed far better than most of Europe in containing the virus and prevent its health service from collapsing. We have come to the end of this news brief. You can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. For Telesur English, I am Janet Perez Moya. Thank you for watching. <laughs>